Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for uh, the introduction and the opportunity to speak. It is a very nice series. I hope you can all see my screen. Just, you know, we, we tested it uh, earlier. So um, yeah, uh, in this talk, I would like to give a survey uh, of some recent results um, about non super symmetric swing models and their phenomenology. Um, so it's um, it, it, it's a very you know vast subject, but I'm going to try to focus on some specific models that are often um, neglected, but they they have some properties. They have some very peculiar consequences due to the nature of the supersymmetry breaking that happens in these models that I think are very interesting, both from a theoretical and from a phenomenological point of view. And all the considerations and the results I'm going to describe uh, have various uh, implications, both from, uh, from the point of view of the Swampland program and for holography as well as uh, you know, string theory in general. Um, so let me first of all start with um, some motivations for this very uh, peculiar type of supersymmetry breaking that I'm going to talk about. So usually, at least in uh, in string phenomenology, what many uh, lines of research do is focus on um, hopefully controllable kinds of supersymmetry breaking, which usually happens at low energies compared to the string scale, or you know, in general, compactifications, scales, and, uh, and the like. But uh, not only recent results, but I, I would argue in general, all that we have learned from these, um, from these works is that somehow um, these mechanisms of, of, of breaking supersymmetry in string theory are somehow artificial. They're not natural in the sense that the theory really wants supersymmetry to be either present or broken at a very high scale. And uh, as I was saying, this is, it seems to me that it's been supported very recently by some uh, swampland considerations due to the um, you know, due to the to what the uh, gravitino mass to how the gravitino mass behaves uh, going to infinite distances in moduli spaces, it seems that there are reasons to believe that in order to have a consistent uh, low energy effective field theory uh, with gravity, um, supersymmetry ought to be broken at a high scale. And, and not only that, uh, earlier considerations uh, that I hinted at seems seem to suggest that uh, the kinds of supersymmetry breaking that we have investigated so far, including the ones I'm going to talk about, uh, really uh, seem to drive the resulting uh, universes, configurations to dynamical, um, you know, we, dynamical um, processes such as instabilities, uh, for instance. So what happens is that somehow trying to force uh, a static configuration uh, with supersymmetry breaking gives some either some inconsistencies or, or some instabilities or some other kinds of uh, uncontrolled um, effects. And the whole point of, of this uh, slide is to you know take this as a starting point. So take this as a reason to build models that have instabilities uh, and to use these instabilities to build a uh, possibly attractive uh, phenomenology, or at least you know attempt to make the first steps in this direction. So since the road from the actual swing models and the final hints of phenomenology is pretty uh, long, I tried to make some sort of of game plan uh, in such a way that you know I I can somehow guide the discussion through this. So the idea is to first introduce the non-supersymmetric stream models I'm going to talk about, uh, and then try to see you know, the very simplest configurations that one can uh, have under control, which in this case are going to be some flux compactifications. And then I'm going to um, describe how these specific vacua and their instabilities 
are connected to a brains, brain constructions and brain dynamics. And this uh, new interpretation uh, also can lead to more, uh, hopefully, more computational control, uh, control through uh, holography, as I will very briefly address. And finally, I will try to get to the punchline that these um, brain interpretation of instabilities in these uh, simple vacua actually appears to lead to some uh, uh, interesting phenomenology in the, in the form of brain world cosmologies. So in, in some sense, top-down constructions uh, within non supersymmetric uh, swing models of brain world cosmologies. So of course, please at any moment, free, feel free to stop me and, uh, and ask any questions. So uh, I would uh, like to start now by introducing briefly uh, these, uh, these swing models I'm going to talk about. Uh, and if you want more details about this, I, I have some backups, uh, backup slides for later, in, just in case. So uh, the, the, there are three models I, I'm going to talk about, but they are organized really in, in two classes. So one is an, a, a heterotic model and uh, the other two are orientifold models. All of these models live in 10 dimensions and their perturbative worksheet formulation uh, has no tachyons in, in the spectrum. So uh, already these models seem pretty attractive in that supersymmetry is broken, but uh, tachyons seem to be absent um, from the spectrum. So in the heterotic case, uh, this is achieved by a non-supersymmetric projection of the supersymmetric exceptional model. And what happens is that once this, the, this projection is performed, um, there are no, um, the super, supersymmetry doesn't, the, the absence of supersymmetry doesn't protect the vacuum energy from getting quantum corrections uh, anymore. And indeed uh, it does, the, the, the vacuum energy does get a non-zero uh, value at one loop, um, which is of the order of the string of the string scale, because indeed all of this is happening at the string scale. And on the other hand, there are these two orientifold models, and one of these two models is similar in nature to the heterotic one in the sense that it is a non-supersymmetric projection of a supersymmetric model, which is the type to be um, string. And, but, but the other one is, a, is, a, is an orientable projection of the tachyonic type 0b string. And the projection is such that the tachyon is eliminated from the spectrum. And at the end of the day, the resulting open string uh, sector, oh, sorry about that. The resulting open string sector uh, involves uh, these gauge groups, which however are not really relevant for our discussion. But what is relevant for our discussion is that in, in space-time, one should, one should think of orientifold planes due to the projection together with uh, D9 brains, either D9 or anti-D9, depending on the context. And this gives rise to an effect that is similar to the quantum corrected vacuum energy in the heterotic model. So in, um, in each case, what happens is that the low energy effective field theory involves an effective potential for the dilaton. And in the case of the orientifold of the type 2b, this is especially interesting because um, even though supersymmetry is broken, you know, generally speaking, it is still realized in the bulk sector, in the closed string sector, whereas it is broken and, and non-linearly realized uh, specifically on the D9 brains. Indeed, there is a Goldstein in, in, the, in the massless spectrum. So all in all, what we're going to use from, uh, from this construction is this uh, specific uh, exponential potential for dilaton that arises due to either one of those effects. So, you know, just to get our ideas uh, more uh, grounded, this is an effective uh, low energy action that forms the basis of the remaining discussion or almost all of it. So we, we get our usual uh, run-of-the-mill uh, gravitational action, gravitational string action in the Einstein frame, except for this new contribution. And depending on the model, there is also a three-form, 
and in some cases, in, in the case of the zero B rentifold, also a five, uh, five form, in, if you wish, but it's not relevant for our discussion. And um, so it, this, this three form field strength is either a Kalbramond field strength in the case of the heterotic model or a Ramon Ramon field strength in the case of the rentifold models. And of, of course, this has consequences in the sense that there are certain P brains that couple to these, uh, to these fluxes. So this is the low energy description. And what can we do with it? Well, again, going back to the game plan, the, the next step is to look at some simple uh, compactifications, some simple uh, vacuum configurations that are hopefully controlled. And this is non-trivial because, again, this potential forbids a flat space vacuum because it's an exponential. So it's absolutely non-trivial whether there are controlled compactifications. And it turns out that um, uh, any kind of warped compactification that you can think of with fluxes even cannot be the sitter. So if, if space-time is maximally symmetric, it cannot be the sitter because it turns out that the sign of the cosmological constant in space-time is determined by this, uh, this factor here where these parameters are you know, encoded in the effective action. And this is always negative for uh, the specific string models. Um, and it turns out uh, that this, uh, this no-go theorem that we have proven is also connected to the, uh, the Sitter conjecture, uh, since we, we can also prove that the effective potential stemming from these compactifications um, not only forbids the Sitter vacua, but it forbids them specifically in the way that the, that the, the Sitter conjecture uh, um, posits. So what's left? Well, one can go forward to uh, study anti desitter compactifications instead. And indeed, uh, there are very simple Freund-Ruben compactifications, so no warping. And uh, here I'm going to describe them as ADS times S, but in general, one can have ADS times any Einstein manifold. And uh, it turns out that depending on the type of model, one can either have a completely electric or complete, completely uh, magnetic type of flux threading the internal space. So only one type of vacuum in, in each kind of model. And the only parameter in the game, the only parameter in the game is the flux number, the, the, which can, we can interpret as the number of uh, certain kinds of P brains present in, in space time. And so, you know, in contrast to the usual ADS5 times S5 uh, supersymmetric solution, this is the only free parameter. So the, the, the string coupling is not actually a modulus, it is fixed by N. And more concretely, you, you can see here, so in, in the case of the rentable models for, a, for an electric flux, what happens is that everything is fixed in terms of the of this number n, there are obviously some some constants up front. But what matters is that the curvature radii, so L is is the curvature radius of ADS, and R is the curvature radius of the internal space. Um, they scale with a positive power of n, and so for large n, you know the curvatures are uh, suppressed in string units. and the string coupling is also constant. So the dilaton is stabilized by the flux. But it's not stabilized to a, you know, it's, it's stabilized to a value that is parametrically small for large n. So everything seems to be under control. And for the heterotic model, it, it's pretty much the same thing. So the numbers are different, but and the flux is magnetic, but everything works out pretty much the same way. Although the origin of the supersymmetry breaking potential is different. So going from here, we have some ADS vacua, very easy to find because everything, you know, every, the equations can be written covariantly, uh, um, you know, and uh, everything boils down to algebra uh, because of maximal symmetry. But as I anticipated, these vacua uh, will probably be unstable, indeed they are, both perturbatively and non-perturbatively. So it helps to gain some string intuition of their origin. And I hinted at brain construction before, and indeed it turns out that these ADS vacua, ADS times S, ADS times M, 
in general, can be recovered as near horizon geometries of, um, of more general geometries that are sourced by uh, stacks of uh, you know, flat stacks of p-brains that are charged with respect to the, to the free form. The, the, these equations are actually written in for general p general dimensions and such, but you know the concrete models uh, have a, a specific form. Um, but in, in general, what happens is that you know writing the equations for the most general ansatz and solving them, one can recover two different asymptotic regimes um, for this uh, very highly nonlinear uh, complicated dynamical system, and so the, the leftmost uh, regime is an, is an ADS uh, throat, which is reminiscent of uh, you know, extremal black brains, extremal black holes and such. Uh, but then once we get away from it, what happens is that after space-time expands for a while, at a finite proper distance, it collapses back into a curvature singularity. So we don't really know, obviously, what happens here from the point of view of string theory, uh, but we know that there are there are uh, some uh, large corrections here that have to be taken into account. But the point is that this happens at a finite distance. So this is actually a manifestation of the scenario that was outlined by uh, Ginevra Buratti, I believe, either last time in in the, in these uh, in the seminar series or. Uh, two times ago, two weeks ago, um, where they um, they proposed this uh, this idea that dynamical tadpoles, such as the one that I'm showing here, produce configurations that have a finite uh, sp uh, spatial extent, which is the, which is indeed the case here. So it appears that the geometry sourced by the brains can indeed recover this ADS vacuum. And so perhaps even the dynamical uh, instabilities can be described in, ter in terms of brains. So um, first of all, there are the perturbative instabilities. And these instabilities can be studied by studying you know, uh, classical fluctuations of fields around the background and their resulting uh, brighton on every bound bound violations. And it turns out that depending on the model, only a finite number of scalar kaluza klein modes around the sphere are unstable. So this is a result of a technical computation and I can show you some uh, plots uh, and the equations if you like. But the bottom line is that since this is a finite number, as a very small number of unstable modes, we can hope to be able to remove them by a suitable uh, modifications of the theory. So either we modify the internal space, which, because as I said, Actually, we only need M to be Einstein in order to be a solution. But in that, in that case, we would need this, the actual Laplacian spectrum in order to see if these values are avoided. The alternative, which in the iterative case is very easy to implement, is uh, an orbifold projection of the sphere. So if you wish, we are replacing the sphere by an orbifold of the sphere um, that uh, ought to have no uh, fixed points in order for uh, twisted states to be absent. And again, in the orientifold case, we have not been able to uh, find such a projection so far, but in the heterotic case, it's just a Z2 antipolar projection that does the job. Uh, so uh, if there are no questions, uh, I would like to move on to the more interesting uh, non-perturbative instabilities. Okay. Um, so the non-perturbative instabilities um, are mediated by flux tunneling, since, uh, I, as I hope to have conveyed in, in the short time, these ADS vacua are essentially made up of a bunch of brains uh, stacked together. So N is supposed to represent the number of brains in, in uh, certain uh, units. And what happens is that the vacuum energy of this configuration is actually proportional to, you know, it, it, it's supposed to be negative because it's ADS, but it's minus an inverse power of N. And so what happens is that flux tunneling, which is essentially the expulsion of brains or the nucleation of uh, pairs of uh, brains and antibrains, what happens is that this process reduces 
the flux number, reduces the number of grains present in the ADS throat, which means that eventually this process drives us outside the regime of validity of the effective field theory. Um, but uh, as I tried to uh, anticipate in the beginning, this is the, re the very reason why we have been able to build a, uh, an interesting scenario for phenomenology. So bear with me for a second, then we'll get there. Um, so what happens again is that brains and brains are, nu are brains nucleate in the ADS throat. Okay, brain enter brain pairs, and we can determine we can compute the decay rate per unit volume of this process. And indeed, the, this brain interpretation does match a gravitational computation in the bulk done with usual uh, instanton calculus. And, you know, extremizing the Euclidean action and doing all the computations um, gives us this, uh, this ugly expression here for the exponent of the nucleation rate, e to the minus uh, Euclidean action. But what I want you to take from, uh, from this ugly expression is that the, ex the, the existence and consistency of this calculation, which is supposed to be semi-classical, actually forces this parameter beta, which is the uh, charge to tension ratio, it's the extremality factor of the brains, to behave in a certain way. So first of all, it, it, it's, it ought to be larger than one in order for the decay to be uh, possible. Indeed, in the supersymmetric case, uh, this beta parameter is exactly one because the D, D3 brains are exactly extremal, even in the background. And so uh, the decay does not happen in that case. One only has domain wall solutions, static domain wall solutions. In this case, uh, this beta parameter uh, ought, should be larger than one and should it be independent of the flux in the large flux limit for this uh, action to be large so that e to the minus s is exponentially small. And what happens is that these requirements actually force the tension of these brains that nucleate to, to, to depend on the string coupling exactly in the form that microscopic brains um, do. So namely one over gs for, uh, for d brains, you know, one over gs squared for NS5 brains, and uh, also this holds for uh, exotic, uh, other kinds of exotic brains. So it's very interesting that this semi-classical calculation of the decay rate actually knows about the microscopic, the microscopics of the fundamental brains that are involved. So this is a further piece of evidence that these vacua are indeed made up of brains and that the instabilities are brains that nucleate away. And after they do nucleate, um, the, the same beta parameter, so V0 nu over T, appears in the potential that the, the Lorentz, that drives the Lorentzian evolution, which is the expansion of the brains. And indeed, it turns out that this V0 parameter here, which is exactly one in the supersymmetric case, it's, it's larger than one uh, for our non-supersymmetric models. And, and so this means that instead of having brains that, you know, external brains that do not either uh, repel or attract, like charged brains do repel. Um, and, and this is due to essentially, you know, renormalization of the charge to, to tension ratio by this finite B naught factor. And uh, we interpreted this as a realization of the weak gravity conjecture for brains in this non-supersymmetric context, because the, the charge to tension ratio is renormalized to a value that is higher than one uh, by a very peculiar mechanism. So this is, uh, you know, very intriguing. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is a you know, pictorial representation of what's going on. The idea here is that the interaction between uh, these brains is mediated by the supersymmetry breaking effects, which are present in the background. And so, um, you know, the, this randomization um, affects the, the charge to tension region in such a way that the brains are repelled like charged brains at least. So all of this, uh, I, I hinted at a holographic interpretation before. So, you know, if, if we stop for a second and think about what's happening, we have 
a bunch of brains that, that source this ADS uh, vacuum for large N, and they slowly repel, you know, they slowly dismantle the stack. So the idea is that for large N, this ADS is very, very close to being stable. So there's supposed to be, and we, we have made various quantitative checks of, uh, of this uh, holographic interpretation that I'm going to describe, there's supposed to be a CFT corresponding to this ADS, but uh, the, you know, the, the actual dynamics is just closed, close to, the, to this fixed point for, for large N. And um, so the, there is this dual CFT that somehow controls the dynamics uh, non-perturbatively, but you know, not quite because there is this instability. And we interpreted this instability as um, holographically dual to a randomization group flow. And the actual uh, flow is essentially the brains that expand away. And the, you know, the, the, the deformation that uh, arises from, uh, you, know, uh, you could think of it as a vacuum value for, a, for, an, for an irrelevant operator um, stems from the actual nucleation of the brains. So the idea is that you know, we have this RG flow and corresponding to fewer and fewer brains, oh, sorry. And uh, as n gets smaller, the flow approaches the would-be fixed points uh, from farther and farther away because the instability grows. So there are various possible trajectories. Um, and at the end of the flow, and this is where the brain interpretation becomes useful, the idea is that from the point of view of the effective field theory, we have absolutely no control over what's happening at small n because large curvatures and uh, higher string couplings. But from this brain string interpretation, we, we could try to use this uh, holography to understand what's happening at the end of this process. And uh, what is supposed to happen compatibly with the uh, emergent string conjecture is that this effect lies at some suitable, uh, in some suitable uh, notion of distance at an infinite distance in, in, the, in the modular space. And the final uh, physics should feature uh, an infinite tower of massless higher spin excitations. So it, it, this is work in progress, but it appears to be the case. Um, so I'm just advertising uh, recent results here. So you know, take them with a grain of salt. Uh, but, but still, this is quite interesting because we, we see various swampland uh, conjectures showing up all around uh, the place in, in this non-supersymmetric uh, context. Uh, so yeah, and, uh, and now, now that we have this uh, coherent pictures, the picture of uh, you know, vacua built of brains and instabilities driving them away to expand and such, what does this do for phenomenology? Well, it turns out that while these brains expand, an observer that lives on the, on the world volume of these brains actually sees a de Sitter geometry. This was uh, an old idea that was revisited very recently by the Uppsala group. And uh, a bo bottom line, bottom up uh, constructions can be used uh, you know, for uh, various uh, computations to see what's happening, but uh, a concrete stringy realization was uh, lacking until uh, until uh, this uh, scenario, as far as I know. And it turns out that not only we have this De Sitter uh, cosmology realized on the brain, but if we compute the, the Hubble constant uh, that this observer sees, it, this is actually connected to this beta parameter uh, connected to the nucleation and the repulsion of the brains. And this is an object, a, a quantity that is exactly zero in the supersymmetric case, so no de Sitter again. But in the, in the non-supersymmetric case, this is of order one. And so all the, the only scale that appears in the game is the ADS radius L, which is large in string units for large N. So we have that not only the ADS bulk appears to be controlled for large N and the instabilities as well, but also the de Sitter brain world appears to be under control. 
and indeed going a bit further and computing the, the Planck mass that the observer sees and the energy density under the sitter, the ratio is actually a negative power of n. For the same reasons, for the same combination of coefficients that gave us the Nogo theorem for the sitter compactifications and the repulsion of extremal brains. So everything appears to be connected. And uh, you know, as far as phenomenology goes, one can go further. Uh, we can add extra things, extra ingredients to this scenario. And this has been done in a series of papers by, by these authors that uh, is, is going forward uh, even now. So we, one can add matter uh, through uh, you know, clouds of strings uh, attached to the brains. Radiation is encoded by black holes in the bulk. And uh, you know, one can explore how the fact that gravity is actually in the bulk affects the gravity on the, on the brain world. So there's lots of things to do here. But the important point I wanted to convey is apparently these scenarios for phenomenology are very naturally embedded in this uh, non-supersymmetric swing constructions. So just to close, um, this is a summary of what I've tried to convey. Um, so the, the, the various uh, lines of research that one can pursue are these as far as uh, you know, I, I listed. So there, are the, there, there is a, the possibility of exploring uh, more in depth the interactions between these brains, uh, which, uh, um, which is also a work in progress and um, it should be out soon. And appar apparently not only uh, the interactions between extremal charged brains are uh, consistent with what should happen, but also the interactions between uncharged brains and charged and uncharged brains. So they all behave uh, in various regimes as they should. So this is encouraging that even if supersymmetry is broken, the various regimes of string theory appears, ap appear to talk to each other in a consistent fashion. So when the brains repel, they repel in every case. When they attract, they attract in every case and so on. And also there are various swamp plan implications that are littered through all these results as I, as I described. And then the most incomplete uh, aspects of, of these works are uh, essentially the exploration of both the bulk geometries generated by these brains, in, especially in the non-extremal case, because the dynamical systems and equations involved are highly uh, nonlinear and complicated. So there is a bunch of things to take into account there. And also, uh, we should probably try to explore this uh, this iter brain world uh, theory further in order to actually you know build the, the explicit effective action with all the curvature corrections and such. So yeah, this is what I wanted to say, and hopefully I conveyed the take home uh, punchline that is that a natural uh, way of breaking supersymmetry at a high scale appears to necessarily involve dynamics, so instability and such. But the idea is that we should take these effects um, not as a hint that we should throw away the theory, but rather as a platform to build some interesting uh, new phenomenology. So thank you for listening. Okay. Uh, let's all thank Ivana. It was a very nice talk using our emojis. Um, while we wait for questions, let me ask one. Um, so you had this picture of um, some flow that kind of gets very close to a, a series of DFT. Yeah, this one. Yeah, and in the in the brain picture, this seemed some fairly reasonable, or it seems like it it should work. Um, on the holographic side, is there, a, is there a mechanism which kind of continues to, that makes you uh, have all of these close calls with these fixed points? Like generically, I would expect that I, you know, I perturb the whatever CFT is above CFT and much greater than one by some relevant operator. Exactly. And that's going exactly. to generate a flow. And I'd expect, hey, maybe I get close to one fixed point, but mm -hmm. 
having this like this strange oscillatory behavior where I get close to a bunch of them. So I, I don't really yeah. understand well, what the. So the idea here, uh, th this is again, th this is work in progress, but uh, the idea here is that these irrelevant uh, operators that you turn on are associated to uh, the brains that separate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the idea is that depending on how many brains you separate, right? If I separate just one brain, the idea is that I flow very nearby the CFT associated mm -hmm. yeah. to N minus one, right? Or if I separate two, I get here. Yeah, th that's the idea. So depending on what you turn on, but th the point is that th this process happens dynamically. Yeah, I, I guess my my question is this this process seems very natural from the brain point of view, but from the holographic picture. Yeah, it's a bit. It seems, um, it seems astonishing. And oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a CFT explanation of this that doesn't rely on the brain. Well, I, I, I think since the, the associated, um, so these arrows are supposed to represent the world volume gauge theories that live in, on these brains that um, in the infrared ought to flow to you know, a fixed point. But the problem is that these fixed points not only they are super, non supersymmetric, but they are strongly coupled always as, at large n. Uh, this is for the same reason why things are nice in the bulk, namely the the, the string coupling uh, GS is fixed by n, right? So the Toft coupling on the gauge theory side is also fixed by n, at least in in, in this infrared regime, and it, and it's always it always is a large like a positive power of n. So it's always large. And um, so there is no dual limit in which you can trust, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the C these CFTs, uh, these, these strongly coupled CFTs should have the infrared version of the operators that you get in the gauge theory by separating the brains. And, and these operators, there is, there's a very wide uh, choice, right? Of these operators because you can separate brains in, in a number of ways and and whatever these operators look like in the infrared is a completely out of control question uh, for, for now uh, except in this uh, small n case which uh, i've been uh, working out recently so but in in the large n case which is accessible in the bulk and intuitive as you said from the cft point of view it's quite hard to understand like precisely what I what I can say is that it seems to me that you know there's very uh, like exotic kinds of uh, you know various possibilities are supposed to be um, dual or you know um, corresponding to the, the all these various possible operators that you can turn on by separating the brains in various ways. That's that's mm -hmm. what I would uh, say. But indeed, it's it's uh, still a work in progress. It's, it's quite hard because these CFTs sure. are always strongly coupled. Cool. Uh, it looks like Irena has a follow-up. Yeah, also regarding what we are discussing, I have a, a question. I, I would like to, to confirm. So the end point, so the CFT1 that you write at the end, mm -hmm. as you say that has a higher spin excitations, I guess this is a free CFT, right? Yes, as far as I, as I uh, you know, it seems the, to be the case, yes. You know, if it's trivial, like if it's trivially gapped or if there is a part which is not free, like whether it's a free part times something non-interactive or... Right, right. So, um, uh, so what I've been, uh, what, what um, well, the, the results that I have, but they're still preliminary, uh, they suggest that what, what, what you have is a free part, a free CFT of fermions and bosons uh, excitations, and a gapped part that in the infrared decouples, right? And that part is indeed interacting. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the gauge sector, if you will. The point is that what happens is, it, it, this is for the, um, the ADS3 case, and these are D1 brains, and the gauge sector that lives on, the, on these brains 
in, in two dimensions actually gaps at low energies. And uh, this is a very peculiar effect of two dimensions. And uh, so, yeah, what happens is that the gap sector, um, you know, the couples uh, in the infrared, what you are left with is, uh, is a free CFT. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, given that apparently we are a bit over time, uh, let us all thank uh, Ivana 